Welcome to the Grateful American Radio Show, hosted by author and publisher David Bruce Smith. What did George Washington do that you might not know about? What did Abe Lincoln know that could change the way you think about the Civil War? You'll learn about all that and more on this special show designed to restore excitement in American history. Let's get started. Welcome to David Bruce Smith's Grateful American series on the Incandescent Radio Network. David's series is an interactive multimedia program designed to restore enthusiasm in American history for children and grown-ups, too. Your hosts for the show are author and publisher David Bruce Smith, creator of the Grateful American series, and myself, Hope Katz Gibbs, creator of the Incandescent Radio Network. Hello, David. Welcome to the show. Hi, Hope. It's great to be here. I'm really excited to be here, too. We are here at Mount Vernon, George Washington's home in Northern Virginia, with Doug Bradburn, founding director of the Fred W. Smith National Library. And this place is unbelievable. We are in the stacks with Martha Washington's papers, sitting adjacent to a room next to George Washington's actual books. They're just feet away. It's incredible. But before we launch into our Q&A... We want to little tell our listeners a little bit about Doug. Before becoming the founding director of the library, he was a professor and director of graduate studies in the history department at Binghamton University. He taught college-level courses at a variety of institutions, held two year-long fellowships, earned a Ph.D. in history from the University of Chicago, and has his B.A. in history and economics from the University of Virginia. Doug is a specialist in the history of the American Revolution and the founding of the United States, which he gave us a tour before, and that will so come through in our Q&A. He's also published numerous articles and book chapters on topics related to the great problems of the revolutionary age. His book, The Citizenship Revolution, Politics and the Creation of the American Union, 1774 to 1804, represents a thorough reconsideration of the meaning of the founding of the nation from the perspective of the political fights over the meaning of individual rights and states' rights within a changing federal union. This is just going to be such an interesting discussion, so let's get started. Welcome to the show. Doug, we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm delighted that you asked me to be on the program. Yes, and we're thrilled to be here at Mount Vernon. So how did you personally develop a passion for American history? I believe that I came to love American history through a real interest in storytelling and in stories. Uh, From an early age, I wanted to be a writer and I was more attracted to stories of our past than in fiction. So uh, that was really, uh, I think, the genesis of my interest. On the other hand, my father was also very interested in history, and I think that has a big impact on people. Uh, When they see their parents reading history or or taking you to historical sites, and these things uh, definitely spurred my interest as well. And you, were, you told us earlier, you grew up in Wisconsin and moved here when you were about 10. How did that change your perspective on history? I think that uh, moving from Wisconsin, where the history uh, wasn't as close to uh, Virginia, the, the history of the founding of the United States and the history of America uh, was told in a different way in Wisconsin. So it was told as the French explorers, and it was told... Uh, you know, in, in the traditional ways. But in Virginia, particularly in Williamsburg, Virginia, where I grew up, it's sort of all around you, you know, and that ability to go to Jamestown and go to Colonial Williamsburg and see the houses, and, and I mean, that, uh, that was uh, a transformative experience for what was probably a strong interest in history to what would become a lifetime passion for, you know, understanding the past. And since we're, we're focused on getting kids passionate about it, we, we're really curious to hear how we can help kids do that even more. But let me uh, can I ask you a question. Uh, this job is a, uh, it's a relocation and a slightly different concentration for you. What was it that lured you to Mount Vernon, and how can you use the house to entice visitors, especially kids? Well, the job was appealing to me because of the ability to speak to multiple audiences about the importance of the past. So as a professor at a university, 
it's great. You get to interact with a lot of college students, and you, you get to teach the survey class, and I got to mentor a lot of graduate students, people who would themselves become teachers, both at the college level and at the high school level. Um, but I felt more and more that I wanted to have a direct uh, communication with different publics. So uh, from different school age children, as well as the general public, as well as leaders in military affairs and politics, and that's one of the things this new presidential library really gives you an opportunity to do. So not only can you stimulate scholarship and encourage it through our fellowship programs and our academic programs, but then you can try to figure out imaginative ways to distribute it to the interest levels of different people. So when we get to kids, when we talk about K through 12, um, that is a great challenge. They all learn in different ways. Um, but what we can do at this institution now is uh, aggressively court them and create materials for them that they're, uh, are appealing to them. But finally, with kids, when it comes to the house itself, getting them to Mount Vernon is half the battle. I mean, if you mm -hmm. get them here, I think just being here is a tremendous way to experience the, the, the estate and, and, and the past. I have two sons. I have a son who's 10 years old and a son who's 8 years old. And they think Mount Vernon is the coolest place ever because they get to run around and see everything. Now, every visitor isn't going to have the access that my children have, so they can kind of experience it over time, much in the way that I consumed Colonial Williamsburg. But uh, I think just for the, the average school kid that can come out here and can go to the museum and go to the house and really get a sense that this man, George Washington, was a real person and that the estate is a real thing, uh, allows them to, to connect themselves to the past in, a, in an exciting way. So how do you make George Washington a real person? I always felt that Abraham Lincoln was beloved and George Washington was admired. Uh, George Washington is a little um, unreachable in history. He doesn't quite seem as human as Lincoln. So how do you deal with that? It's a great challenge, and I think you're right. I mean, Washington himself was becoming, he was called the father of his country before the American Revolution was over, and he would have a whole nother career after that as the first president, as the president of the Constitutional Convention. So the, the, the greatness of Washington uh, is so tremendously overwhelming at times that it's just very difficult to find the man be beneath uh, the icon. I mean, he's on the dollar bill. He's in your pocket as a, a on a quarter, but his monument, unlike the Lincoln Memorial, is uh, is an obelisk. It's an abstract obelisk. It's not a man sitting in a chair with his words around him, uh, you know. And so the story of Washington needs to be told in a way that that explains that he's a human being, that he, a man who made uh, failures, who struggled through adversity, who wasn't perfect at all. Uh, and I think some of those stories for kids would be really eye-opening, particularly Washington's um, really youthful emergence as a leader in Virginia. I was telling you all earlier about his trip uh, out west when he's there to deliver this message to the French in the Ohio Valley. And, and it's an extraordinary tale of adventure and a hardship. And it's a, a tale, I think, that that not many people know. Um, so there are ways, I think, that you can try to get people to see a new Washington. But I think you're right, David. I think, I think the challenge is the very ubiquity of Washington. It makes him a little less, uh, um, you know, less easy for people to get at.